Welcome back, everyone. Um, hi, my name is Benny Siegert. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, package storage on Chrome OS. Uh, so it's not directly running on BSD, but we're using a component of NetBSD, which is package source, and running it on Chrome OS, uh, which is Linux based. But you know, um, so so first I'm going to tell you why why we're going to do this thing, uh, or why I'm doing this thing for for myself in this way. Um, and then I'm going to present a little bit about Chrome OS because it's quite an interesting uh, operating system, in my opinion. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at bootstrapping package stores so that we can use um, various packages uh, that are in there. And then some future work because, um, as I said, right now uh, the work of getting package stores working well on um, on Chrome OS is very much a work in progress, but we're going to see that. So first of all, why why am I doing this? Um, so I personally, I think Chromebooks are very attractive laptops. Um, so you might be seeing that I'm presenting from a FreeBSD machine because uh, this Chromebook uh, and this long chain of adapters didn't really work together. But other than that, you know. Uh, they're kind of secure. Um, they have secure boot on by default. Uh, operating system images are signed. Um, updates are signed. Um, they they boot really quickly. They they don't have uh, a BIOS nor UEFI. Instead, they have something that's uh, uh, similar to uh, Linux BIOS. I think it's, it's called something else these days. Um, so they, from, from switching it on to getting to the login screen is like five seconds, which is great. Um, I've never had one break from the software. Uh, so this, the updates come weekly. They, they're installed in the background. Uh, the only thing you notice that in the system tray, you get a little um, arrow icon. And, and that essentially says the next time you're going to uh, restart your computer, you're going to have a new version, which is nice. Um, the the prices for the, the pricing for the hardware is often quite competitive. Um, I like the fact that they run Android apps. So for those that don't know, Chrome OS in a sense is Chrome, the browser, is your operating system, right? Um, but these days you can uh, um, you can run Android apps on them, and that's super handy. For example, I'm running the Fostem Companion Android app on this laptop, and that allows me to like schedule or look at what talks I want to see. Um, and finally, one of those things um, that you either believe in or not um, is you could say it's the power of the cloud. Um, and a Chromebook is mostly a stateless device, uh, so it holds, it holds your account. Uh, the account credentials are, are Google account credentials, actually. So if you have a Gmail account, you use that to log in. Um, but all of the settings. Um, are synced through various cloud mechanisms, and um, most of the data you store is going to be stored in something like Google Drive. So what that means is, if uh, if uh, w my Chromebook breaks, I can get a new one. Uh, I can log in on that machine, um, and then I get a uh, basically an empty desktop. And then one by one, like icons start reappearing, and the Chrome apps are being reinstalled and everything. And then like five minutes later, it it is as it was with. Uh, the exception of uh, things I've downloaded to the local hard drive. Um, so that's kind of nice. However, we're going to um, <laughs> sort of get um, remove this property in a few minutes by installing software locally. <coughs> but sure, why not? Um, now, as I said, uh, it's, Chrome OS is an operating system where the browser is the OS, or at least that's what the marketing speak says. So how, how are we going to get um, local software on this thing? There's two ways. There's really three ways. Um, the first one is you can install something called Termux. It is an Android app that uh, pretends to be a terminal emulator, but it happens to include uh, uh, more or less full Linux user land. So you can, you can configure that. And then your software that you install um, is going to run in that Android thing. Um, and you can interact with it through the, the, the graphical front end, essentially, or 
uh, you can set up SSH and SSH into that container or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, that's the way that some people use, but um, the thing I chose is uh, you can set up the machine in developer mode. Um, so developer mode removes certain restrictions um, and it's originally it's meant for people developing the OS themselves, but we can also use it to develop software locally by installing software. And then uh, uh, developer mode is a, it used to be a hardware switch, these days it's a software switch. Um, some, like if you have a managed Chromebook, for example, if your employer gives you one, it's very likely that you're not allowed to switch that on. Uh, so that's very unfortunate. However, there's this way number three, and it's kind of the sneak preview. Uh, if you go into Crush, the Chrome OS shell, um, you'll notice there is a very poorly documented command that's just called C, and it says, run something in a container. And it's very intriguing. Um, yeah, you can look into the uh, source code to, to work out how it works. Uh, uh, I think the idea is that you can set up a local container containing a user land, and it would be isolated enough so that you can use it even in non-developer mode. Uh, however, it requires the container to be signed in some way, and I haven't figured out how that works. But, uh, and it's also not officially released, but you know the, the command is there, and the source code is also there. Uh, so developer mode it is. Um, so how, how does Chrome OS look internally? Uh, it's based on Linux. It's based on Gentoo Linux. That's probably the first big surprise. Um, if, you, if you ever build Chromium OS, that's the open source version of Chrome OS. If you ever build Chromium OS from source, um, there's a thing called repo that will download like various Git repos and stuff. Uh, and then at some point, like, Portage starts up and starts emerging things. It's a bit weird, but hey, it's a really well integrated Gentoo system, so why not? Um, so on the on the Linux kernel, um, Chrome is your main user land thing that runs. There is no X server in between. There is no Wayland in between. I think it's Chrome runs directly on the frame buffer, I believe. Um, and uh, the Android runtime, so the whole running Android applications locally, um, runs in a local container. It shares the host kernel, um, which is interesting. So if you do a, PX in a, a PS in a terminal, you're going to see uh, the typical thingamajig daemon, uh, the kernel processes, and then there are all these processes with names like uh, com.google.android.blah. Um, and they're all in the same process space. Um, so this container provides some isolation. Um, and this isolation between users is a little bit of a figment and a little bit not. It's, it's a bit special, as so many things. There is one non-privileged user in the system. It's called Kronos. Uh, incidentally, Kronos is the the code name that Chrome OS itself had internally before it was released. Um, and, and of course, there's the root user and various system users. Um, when you're seeing the login screen in the UI, uh, it presents you with all the users that have accounts on the system. Um, it's already a logged in user session from the, the Unix point of view. So the, the Chrome that renders the login window already runs as user Kronos. Uh, and when, when you enter your password and you quote unquote log in in the UI, what happens is um, <coughs> for every user that has an account, there is an encrypted file system image, and the encryption key is based on your password. Uh, so with the password you entered, it's going to uh, mount and decrypt the, this file system container uh, that contains your files. And it's going to be mounted under Home Chronos user. So the Home Chronos basically is all the u users on the system, whereas home Chronos user, which is also set to dollar home, is inside this encrypted file system. Um, in developer mode, you have uh, uh, virtual terminal number two, control alt F2, although F2 is really the uh, forward arrow key. Um, opens a text console with a standard login. Looks fairly 
standard, like a like a um, Gentoo system, um, and crush the Chrome OS shell, which you reach by pressing Control Alt T, um, gains a new command called shell, and that gives you a bash. And so, so that's what I mainly use for working uh, on the command line. Um, so you're going to have a browser tab, and the browser tab runs a terminal, um, and in the terminal uh, you have bash, and you can run tmux or whatever you want to run. Um, you could also, if you don't like this particular terminal emulator, you could also set up SSH and SSH into your local machine, but you don't really need to. Um, so that's the story about user, user isolation. There are a couple more idiosyncratic features of the OS that you stumble over when you use it. Um, so first of all, the first thing I noticed is that there's no man command. And it is kind of weird. But then again, um, the operating system you use is not really meant to be used on a command line. So I can see them not including it. Uh, package source WIP does have a package for man. Uh, I haven't tried that out, but that, in principle, should work and should give you man pages. Um, the the awk command on the system, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, is very, very minimal and restricted uh, for security reasons. Um, the only editor I found in the base system by default is Vim. Um, and Vim is compiled with a tiny feature set. So it has no like syntax highlighting. Uh, uh, I think it does have several buffer. I'm not sure if it has multi-buffer support, but it has no syntax highlighting, no diffing, um, no language extension support, no whatever. But you can edit files with it, so it's close enough. Um, and it has a somewhat aggressive um, thing that kills processes that have buffer overruns. I don't know exactly how that is called. Um, but for example, the, this Vim thing, when I try to build a full-featured Vim from package stores, uh, it gets killed immediately upon startup with, there's had been a buffer overflow detected. I'm going to kill this process. And I haven't figured out why. Um, and then the other thing is that they removed various things from the system, such as NIS, which nobody in their right mind would use, especially in 2018. Um, or uh, a, a bunch of libraries that are on the system are uh, not delivered with headers, which again is understandable because, uh, yeah, it's a system that you use that you don't develop in theory. Um, and that trips up a bunch of software that essentially is badly written that says, like, this is a Linux system, so there should really be an SE Linux library uh, with its headers. And if there's not, then it just breaks. Um, so, so that's something I've, I've tripped over a few times. Uh, other than that, it's, it's actually a surprisingly uh, standard Linux user land. Um, you're in for a surprise when you run the mount command, though. Uh, this is a tiny abstra extract of it. Uh, in a full screen terminal, mount is more than a screen full. Uh, most of that is um, because of all those bind mounts and null mounts and whatever they're called, where you can like graft a bit of the file system somewhere else, which they use for setting up container paths and so on. And like, there's an emulated SD card in the Android container slash SD card directory, and all, all a bunch of nonsense like that. Um, but the essential structure that I would like to work you through is on slash you have this device manager device, um, and it's read-only. Um, you can, when you, when you set your machine into developer mode, uh, you can set it into some sort of ex extended developer mode or whatever it's called, where everything gets read-write, and you can SSH in without a password and all, a, a whole bunch of other things. I don't recommend that. Um, so I recommend you to leave the slash partition read-only. Um, and keep it managed by the OS updater, essentially. So you're going to keep getting these weekly updates. And every time, it's going to just do random things that you don't care about in the slash partition. Um, and uh, you can even, once you're in developer mode, you can re-enable secure boot, because it by default gets disabled. And um, 
and then your, your operating system images are verified, which is good. Um, the other thing, uh, the other two important partitions are the one that's called stateful partition, and that is read-write, um, and the OEM partition, which in my, on my machine has almost nothing. The, the OE, so the, the, the manufacturer of the Chromebook can put their own crap in there. Um, and the stateful partition is the one that holds the encrypted file system image for all the users. Um, they're just, you know, loopback, loopback mounts of, on that partition. And the stateful partition is also the thing that is wiped when you, as they call it, power wash the device. Um, and, <clears throat> and it's the thing that has the main, um, main part of the internal storage. So the slash is relatively tiny and the most of it is on the stateful partition so you can use it for your data. Um, so you see home chronos user, that's the encrypted uh, file system thing. Um, uh, user local is one of those bind mounts. Um, one thing to notice is that your home directory is no SUID, no dev, and no exec. So developing inside there is no fun. <laughs> However, uh, the only bit of the file system that is exposed to the UI of the local file system is uh, the downloads folder under your home. So what I do is I have a home Kronos user downloads source where I put all my source trees so I can use like GUI editors and Chrome apps to, to work on those. But if I want to compile something, then I need to put in some, some sort of temporary directory or, or you know, package source. All of it is in, is in user local for me. <coughs> so, so here's my recommendation. As I said, leave the root partition read only, uh, play around in user local or the stateful partition, which is the same thing really. Um, or uh, you might choose to, to put an SD card or something or even a USB stick into your laptop and format that as X2 and mount it without no exec and then play in that. Maybe that's also sensible because you can make a very large SD card these days. Could you jump on the bind mount bandwagon and just bind mount stuff into place to have like those conventional parts? You could probably. I haven't tried that. But pa package source is um, not very uh, opinionated. It allows you to install it anywhere. So that's so that's that's nice. Um, so now let's let's jump to package source actually. Um, so pa what is it? It's the NetBSD package collection. And at the time of writing, we've passed the twenty thousand package mark, which is quite a lot. Um, so these packages are so the main part of package source is essentially a, a large tree of of make files that encode how to build all these packages, how to uh, what their dependencies are, like what what packages you need to have installed before you can even try to build, and so on and so forth. Um, package source is released once a quarter every three months. The last release was called 2017 Q4, was uh, around the uh, New Year's Eve. Um, uh, these releases are kept up to date with security updates, although. I'll show uh, the the stuff I'm going to show you later is all on package source current, unfortunately, um, and uh, in principle it has the um, the possibility of using binary packages or building things from source. However, uh, because this is a new platform, um, there are no binary packages yet. Um, package source itself supports 20 different OS types um, and several variants. Um, and a whole bunch, basically any architecture that uh, that o those OSs might run on. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, Chrome OS itself has four different architectures. Uh, it has uh, essentially 32-bit x86, 64-bit x86, and then ARM in uh, 34, uh, uh, 32 and, and 64 bits. So, so this Chromebook over there is, a, is a, um, the Samsung Chromebook Pro. Um, is AMD 64 architecture. The Samsung Chromebook Plus is a 64-bit ARM. Um, so you have all the variants. Um, I've only tested AMD 64. Challenge number one, when you want to build stuff, where do you get a compiler, or rather, where do you get a tool chain from? Um, 
So Chrome OS uh, has a command in dev mode that's called dev install that's supposed to install <coughs> tools for you to develop. But ins however, it installs a whole bunch of crap like Ruby and, and, and uh, Python and like scripting language nonsense, um, but no C compiler. And they, uh, somebody asked on a mailing list, like, what is this? And they <laughs> said, we're working on it, but we don't have anything yet. So, so that's bad. Um, if this were an ideal world, uh, we would have somebody else, for example, me, would have already built binary packages for, say, GCC. So you could just install a binary bootstrap kit, uh, add the packages, and have a tool chain. However, I'm not at that point yet, unfortunately. Uh, so we're going to need some sort of a bridge uh, to get a C compiler now that we don't have one yet. Um, so I, I found uh, there are different things that you might try. I found this thing called Chrome Brew. And it's, it's pretty intriguing. It's based on Homebrew, <laughs> except for Chrome. Um, and it's written in Ruby because it's Homebrew based. Um, and you install it with this fun command, uh, like just wget a thing and pipe it into bash, um, which I did. <laughs> um, and uh, its redeeming feature is that it has a binary. So this is the, the home page of Chrome Brew. Um, it has binary packages available for, for all four Chrome architectures, uh, Chrome OS architectures. So that's nice. It's GPL licensed. Um, so good shout out to them. They've, they're quite a bit further down uh, the rabbit hole than I am. Uh, so installing, uh, once you've installed Chrome Brew, like you pipe this command into bash, um, you use the command called crew, uh, install GCC and Linux headers. Um, it'll, it'll say it needs to install various other things. Uh, then it says, oh, look, there's a binary package available. Downloads the things, installs. It's actually really nice. Um, now we're going to do the following. Uh, we're going to install, uh, we're going to download the package source current tarball from the uh, package source FTP, extract it in user local. Uh, um, as I said before, you enter shell to enter the shell, um, and then you change into the bootstrap directory and call the bootstrap script. And it immediately exits and says, your shell's echo command is not BSD compatible. Oh, look, you should have another shell. Um, I've, it turns out if you export uh, bin bash as your sh, it works. Doesn't seem particularly BSD, but OK. Um, so try to. Uh, this is the, the um, bootstrap command. This is actually try 10 or something. Um, this is the command line I settled on. I'm going to explain to you what all those uh, parameters mean. Uh, the first one, unprivileged, is uh, really nice. It'll uh, install everything as user chronos, so you don't have to use sudo all the time. Um, you might like that or not, uh, I, I do. Um, then the next thing is the installation directories. Uh, so I said the source tree I unpacked under user local package source. I use user local package as the, the prefix. And then I put the var and uh, package db inside that prefix. So everything is nicely self-contained. You can up, um, back up user local pkg um, and have your entire installation there. Um, then C wrappers equal no is a fun one uh, that took me a while. So C wrappers is, it's kind of hard to explain even, um, is a package source uses a set of wrappers around things like a compiler, the linker, and so on. And it can do various things such as um, adapt the command lines to different versions of compilers. You can tell it to like remove things from the command line. Like if the build system insists on adding, I don't know, dash p thread and you don't want it, you can tell it to remove that parameter. And, and so there's two, two implementations of the wrappers. There's the, the, the old ones, the old and busted ones, they're written in shell. And the new hotness is written in C. Um, <laughs> uh, it's quite a bit faster too. However, um, because of the way the bootstrap detects the presence or absence of various things. It detects there's no patch command, which is true. Um, so it installs diffutils. And diffutils depends on a whole bunch of other things. And so it ends up creating a circular dependency where a 
To install C wrappers, you need to have diffutils installed, but to build diffutils, you need C wrappers installed. Um, so you bootstrap without C wrappers, and then you delete, once you've bootstrapped, the line that says C wrappers equal no from your makeconf, and then the rest will be built without. Um, and then prefer package source equal yes, because uh, the, 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 the libraries, as I said, that are delivered by the base system are often incomplete in various ways. And here I put six jobs. This, um, uh, this machine has four threads, so six make jobs is a good uh, way of getting the maximum build performance out. And then this happens on Chrome Beta, Chrome 64 and later. Uh, it'll run happily for a while, and then it says I'm going to install the bootstrap MK files, and then you get this fun message, AWK runtime error pipe execution not allowed in sandbox mode. You go, what the hell is this? Um, it turns out uh, the AWK that Chrome OS delivers has been used in uh, an exploit as a vector of running a command. And uh, I don't know the, all the exact details, but you know that uh, there is this thing called pwn to own or something, um, and Chrome OS regularly has good uh, performance, sometimes not so good, and one of those exploit chains that did the full compromise of the system used awk. So they said, we're going to fix that, and they implemented the sandbox mode for mock, which is the, their awk, um, uh, and they install a version of awk that is permanently set into the sandbox mode, so it cannot run it cannot do networking, it cannot run pipes, it cannot open files with programmatic names, and so on and so forth. Uh, which is kind of annoying because the dependency management of package source needs uh, those features. Um, so I fixed that on Friday in the train. Um, essentially, just the bootstrap kit now detects that you're on Chrome OS and sets needs org equal yes, and then we build a NetBSD org and everything is fine. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I did uh, in this uh, work is to uh, properly support Chrome OS specific hacks and <coughs> customizations um, by making it a sort of first class citizen in package source. Package source has the concept of an OS variant, and that was invented for Solaris derivatives or Sun OS derivatives. So you might know there is like, it, yeah, uh, there's Illumos. Uh, and open Indiana and a bunch of others, so they are distinguished by setting this OS variant variable. So now in, in package source current um, on Linux, we essentially put the lowercase distro name in OS variant, and so you can check if OS variant equal Chrome OS, then you put some, some customization. Um, some, some things that break on the platform when it's upstream's fault, I try to send patches upstream. There there's, have been a couple ones where I did that. Um, so back to our, our little use case. Now that we have uh, installed package source, we can install some software. Uh, first of all, you want to add this path thing at the end of your bash RC so that all the commands you install in, um, in package source are available from the command line. Uh, then you can just go to any old directory, such as lang slash go, my personal favorite. Um, do bmake package install. It'll download the sources, uh, check for dependencies, install those first, then download the sources, build everything, install, uh, and create a bin binary package. Uh, you can take those binary packages um, and move them to other machines. It's all nice. If you go to package source.se, uh, it has a searchable web catalog of the 20,000 plus packages. Um, so once you find something there, you can just install and use. Uh, and in my last uh, 40 seconds, I'm going to quickly summarize the future work for this. Um, and I also want to say we're open for contributions. So if you have a Chromebook and you're interested in, in joining this effort, uh, please uh, get in touch. Uh, we have a debug tracker, and uh, we have a GitHub even, uh, although it's a read-only mirror. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, my, my first point that I want to fix is I want to have a full tool chain as package source binary packages. So that means bin utils, um, GCC, and so on. And then we can get rid of uh, the Chrome Brew requirement um, 
and you will just be able to download a bootstrap kit and binary packages. Um, and I want to package some things that are not in base. So, so again, there's some software that thinks if you're on Linux, you must have Linux, uh, POSIX extended attributes. However, the library is not there on Chrome OS, so you can add those via package source. Man is another example. And finally, look into support for X applications. So as, as far as I understand, you cannot mix graphical, I know, graphical uh, X applications on the Chrome OS desktop. But I think you can launch an X server on a new virtual terminal, such as VT3. And that should work in the future. And that's it. And we don't have time for questions. <laughs>